coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. To create health on a piece of land, to set up a farming system, part of that system is going to rely on animal partnership and animals that will be living and dying as part of that system, just like there's living and dying of, you know, the plant kingdom, earthworms or, you know, nematodes or microorganisms. There is life and death in the system. And instead of looking at just one death, looking at overall year after year, there's more life holding capacity in that farming system. That's kind of the exploration journey that we've been on. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 372. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, I have Ryland Englehart on the show. He's the co-founder and executive director of Kiss the Ground. He's also the co-creator of the award-winning transformational documentary film, May I Be Frank. He's an entrepreneur activist and works to inspire more gratitude into our culture. He speaks on sacred commerce, tools for building community, and regeneration, and is the host of the Kiss the Grounds We Can Do This podcast. At the time of this interview release, Kiss the Ground just released a new documentary under that same title, Kiss the Ground, and it's on Netflix right now. It came out a week ago. I highly recommend going and watching it. It's a real eye-opener. This is a full-length documentary narrated by Woody Harrelson. It's shedding light on an alternative approach to farming called regenerative agriculture. And if you've been listening to a lot of the recent shows, this is a topic I've got into with a number of guests, and it's a topic I'm passionate about continuing to learn more about and spreading the good word because it's just such a powerful way to farm. It has the potential to balance our climate, replenish our vast water supplies, and feed the world. Ryland's such an interesting guy. I had a really great time connecting with him, and we just had a great conversation. I know you're going to love it. Some of the highlights include how soil is our common ground, the story of Cafe Gratitude, Growing up a child of hippie parents, the bee love tattoo movement, experimenting with the plant medicine ayahuasca, and of course we get into regenerative agriculture and how this could be a solution for climate change. Lots of great stuff in this one. I'd really appreciate it if you could help spread the word and share this with somebody in your life, and I thank you ahead of time. And now here I go with Ryland Englehart. Ryland, welcome to the podcast. Excited to chat with you today. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. It's an exciting moment in my life, and so it's a fun time to share and broadcast what I'm up to. Yeah, big movie released tomorrow on Netflix. Congrats. Kiss the Ground. This is the brand that uh, you're a co-founder of, and the big movie is is finally here. This is going to come out a week after the release of the movie, so people can go to Netflix and check that out. But uh, I got to watch the film ahead of time and loved it. You guys have put together something amazing here, and people are really going to get a lot from it. Mm, yeah, thank you so much. It's uh, a gratifying and uh, beautiful moment to have a dream about a message and a story and a narrative becoming adopted at a, a broad global scale. And to be at this moment, you know, having that film going to be up in 25 different languages and available to be seen in 186 million homes starting, you know, on the 22nd of September. So really, Really, really excited. Thank you. Yeah, the possibility of people being awakened to that regeneration is possible and uh, really creating a new paradigm for how we can uh, relate and manage land and do agriculture in a way that actually can have a, a net benefit versus a destructive degenerative effect on our planet. So, at a moment when there's a lot of divide, a lot of sides, a lot of opinions, And I just am excited to be bringing a message of unity and togetherness and that soil is our common ground and that here's something that we can all rally behind and support. And that was the thing that kind of took me by such a surprise and impacted me seven years ago. When I first learned about soil and regenerative agriculture, I really got that it was the thing that everyone who eats could participate in this revolution. I don't know if you know this, but I've been in the health food, health world space for 15 years. I pioneered with my family a restaurant called Cafe Gratitude, uh, Gracias Madre. I'm excited that we've been able to continue to reinvent ourselves and continue to push the envelope further 
in where plant-based food was 15 years ago when it was in the total margins and it's now become quite mainstream, I'm excited for the the next chapter to be really understanding regenerative agriculture. And again, it's not about exactly what you're eating, it's how what we're eating was produced, grown, and the effect that it had in its whole life cycle. And that we can have food that has a life cycle, a beneficial life cycle, uh, which is so exciting and inspiring. Well, we're going to get more into the film and more into regenerative agriculture. But you mentioned quite a bit there. I want to get into the story of Cafe Gratitude, get into your story and kind of build up to the film. Great. So let's go all the way back to Cafe Gratitude, the early days. I know this restaurant was actually started first back in 2004 in San Francisco. So take me back to the time in your life. What was happening when this began to come together? Yeah. So I think I was 23 years old. I was living in Los Angeles. Me and my sister had just kind of bankrupted a company, a recording studio company. She was depressed. We had to sell our house. We had to sell our all our recording equipment. It was kind of a, a meltdown moment. And I was really kind of, yeah, given up. I was, I was kind of really depressed and just lost in life and didn't know what was next for me. And, you know, just really looking at like, what if it wasn't about you know, getting paid, or if it wasn't about, you know, being important, what did I love to do? And, you know, what I love to do was create food for people and to inspire people around, you know, natural health, food as medicine, having people try new things that they like that were tasty, but also were healthy, that they could see themselves more identifying with, especially if they were more used to standard American diet. And when, when I was running a recording studio, I was always we would have people in our in our recording studio who would be sick and I'd always be giving them these little kind of echinacea and you know natural herbs tuning people into you know food is medicine it was back in 2002 and so you know one thing people always said you should open a restaurant you you know you really you love food you love healthy food you love inspiring people to eat better and at that same time my folks were exploring the idea of opening a restaurant in the bay area under the name cafe gratitude and I had kind of tried to go away from my family business. I wanted to like kind of make it on my own and, you know, kind of the prodigal son story of like, I don't want help from my family. I want to go do it on my own. And then I realized what they were doing was something beautiful. And, you know, I, I wanted to get in the restaurant business. I wanted to, you know, create healthy meals for people. And so I humbly asked my dad uh, if I could join him in his journey of building Cafe Gratitude as a business. And I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And I asked him, can I come learn the business and come back to LA and open my own Cafe Gratitude a year later? And he said, of course, I'd love, you know, nothing more than you know, having you join the family business. So I went back to San Francisco. We opened, uh, or I came back right after the first opening, the first Cafe Gratitude. It's like a 1,400 square foot little restaurant in the Mission in San Francisco. And for those that don't know, Cafe Gratitude is an all organic plant-based restaurant really focused at the early days like at like you know raw live food we didn't have a stove we didn't have a hood we just had warm miso broth the only cooked grain was quinoa which pe- at the time people didn't know about quinoa you know we were some of the first people doing cold pressed juice before that was even in the lexicon of understanding we were making you know fresh pressed almond milk when there was no almond milk at the stores you know now it's ubiquitous it's at starbucks it's everywhere uh, there was no such thing as cold brew coffee on the mainstream. Now it's at Seven Eleven. So you know these were these are kind of these health food things that we were kind of pushing and getting behind in the early days. And then you know the whole other besides plant based vegan raw food, the whole business was really driving. You know, can we have a business that has an attitude and an ethos and a mission that is really not just like a mission on the wall but is literally a way of being that's lived, that you walk into a a restaurant where the attitude of the brand is literally living in the interaction with every guest and bringing each customer into that experience. And the experience where we were, you know, healthy food, delicious, healthy food, but also it was cafe gratitude. So the food obviously was the plant-based organic vegan food, but then the whole gratitude aspect was probably the even more unique thing, which was, the whole restaurant was designed actually around a game 
called the Abounding River Board Game, which was a board game like Life or Monopoly that was about bringing people into conversations, dialogues about gratitude, bringing people into the present moment of in this present moment, what are you grateful for? And getting us out of like concept, but in the experience of right here, right now, what are we grateful for? What am I grateful for? It nows us when we're grateful. It brings us into the present moment and it satiates that aspect of human being, which is so, you know, more desire, craving, consumption. Uh, how can I, you know, feel full? And when we're grateful, it actually grateful. It fills us up for a second, a split second when we're in the state that the act of expressing our gratitude, we are in a state of fulfillment, of peace. And so we wanted to bring that to the culture of California, which ultimately California culturally oftentimes impacts the United States and then, you know, the world. And we thought, all right, we're going to create this very unique design, dining experience and hopefully it will help transform food culture, but also just business culture. You know, my folks wrote a book called Sacred Commerce, which was a business philosophy of how to run a business where you're not only creating value for your customers and, you know, having, uh, you know, a sustainable impact or a positive impact within your supply chain, but also bringing transformation to the world through uh, the philosophy and the culture of, of your business. And so we did, you know, wild revolutionary things where we, everybody who'd come on to shift in the restaurant, they would actually sit in with another employer or manager and go through a process called the clearing process where you'd ask a series of questions like what's one thing that's distracting you right now and you'd be able to share something distracting you so you could kind of identify what's in the unconscious and then bring our attention to what are you grateful for? What do you love about your life? What moves you from your head to your heart? And bring people into a state of gratitude to start their shift and so that that way of being could then be transferred and transmitted and creating a transaction of customer service into a transformation of the interactions of people being present and really seeing that service inside of Cafe Gratitude. It wasn't just about serving for a tip, but it was actually serving from the greatest joy in our lives. And when we're truly connected to, I want to elevate your experience. I want to give you something that you're not even expecting that might delight you. We've been doing that for 15 years in Southern California, started in San Francisco, and then me and my brother grew the business to, to Los Angeles in 2011, and we've opened seven restaurants in Southern California over the last 10 years. That's incredible. And you said something there that really caught my attention back when you're talking about working at the recording studio with your sister, when you said that when people got sick, you would propose they take things like echinacea or other herbs. So obviously you weren't in the Cafe Gratitude stratosphere at that point. It wasn't even a thing. Or maybe it was a thing just starting, but you weren't involved. So where did that come from? Where did it, oh, I mean, where did you get an interest in herbs? Like, you know, somebody working in a recording studio, like how did that well, originate, that interest? Yeah, I mean, I'm a child of hippie parents. I grew up on a 20-acre old dairy uh, farm in upstate New York outside of Ithaca. And we had big vegetable gardens, apple orchard, a pond with fish in it. I grew up playing in the woods. And really just my, my childhood was observing nature and, you know, kind of a lot of homeschooling. Then Waldorf School, uh, Rudolf Steiner, who started biodynamic agriculture and also started Waldorf education. And my parents, their philosophy was always that their spirituality was really that we were, we were all one that we are all cells in one body and uh you know how can we understand that we're we're a totality we're a oneness and how can we support the whole by our actions i never went to the doctor my whole i mean my whole life i think i i think i went to the doctor for the first time when i was like 20 20 years old i mean doctor wasn't uh part of our thing we were you know we had homeopathic remedies we had herbs, we had, you know, I, I remember as a child, you get a bee sting, you go out to the garden, you find some plantain, it's like a, it's this big kind of leafy ear looking thing, you chew it up and make a big kind of, uh, almost like a dip, and then you put that on your, your bee sting, and that sucks the, you know, that sucks the venom out of your, out of your arm. So it was, you know, part of the, my fabric, my DNA of 
you know, growing up outdoors on nature, obviously my parents' philosophy and understanding of the world and, and medicine and food is medicine. It was my life. It was, it was kind of just what I did no matter what. It was just kind of um, full. It wasn't something I learned at one time. It just became, it was like baked into my whole upbringing such that it, everywhere I went, it was kind of part of who I was being and how I was interacting with the world. Yeah, that gives a lot of context. And you mentioned your parents were hippies and you're explaining this whole, this whole hippie world you grew up in. Where did that originally stem from? Were their parents hippies as well? Or how did, how did they get involved in all this? You know, my dad was, uh, he, you know, he's kind of a rebel and his parents were professors, but they were also pretty liberal and pretty radical in that in upstate New York. I think my, you know, my grandmom, you know, was dating a black man in the, in the, in the forties. Um, and she was, I think the first member of the NAACP in up in Plattsburgh, New York. You know, I remember something my grandma, she said, if we're not talking about sex, religion, or politics, what the heck are we talking about? So they weren't hippies, but they were pretty open-minded. They were, um, and really they empowered my dad. Instead of going to college, he asked if they would help him buy an old log cabin on a piece of land uh, in upstate New York. And my dad ended up doing two years living actually in a teepee, having every meal made on a a campfire, even through the winter. And so, you know, he was kind of a a back to the lander. And just that was kind of what he gravitated to. And then, you know, that opened up into his exploration into spirituality and meditation, transcendental meditation. Um, You know, he, you know, has had many spiritual teachers over my whole lifetime. You know, our diet in our family oftentimes changed based on what the current teacher or guru was, was saying was, you know, the highest and holiest of uh, diets. But for the most part, you know, we, we grew up eating healthy, plant-based, uh, organic foods, natural foods, unadulterated foods, simple foods. And my mom's actually the first business was called her name is Jean, and people called her Jean the Bean, and it was called the Benevolent Bean. Um, and it was a tempeh and, and tofu company in the this is probably late seventies, early eighties. Yeah, so it was just it's just part of part of my the fabric of my life. I'm grateful that I had such eccentric, wild parents that were exploring consciousness, exploring ideas, exploring the world outside of the conventional. And it allowed me to see a lot of different new things that I probably would have never explored or, yeah, found. And then, you know, and then I I ended up getting into Landmark Education, which is a big part of, I probably did about a 10-year span of transformational work with Landmark. I got into plant medicine and, uh, you know, found a huge value of awakening and transformation and love and gratitude in that exploration. And so, you know, I really lived my life as like, how can I, how can I be an expression of love? You know, kind of my personal mission statement is being the presence of love. My Instagram is love being Ryland. I've always, since early childhood, you know, it was like, how do I be a a force of love in the world? You know, that was expressed, you know, and, and I've always been someone who's building community around ideas. I've definitely been called a perfect candidate to be a cult leader. And I, and, you know, I've I've stayed away from that because I I, I can see how tempting and also dangerous that can be. But I, what I do love is I love building community around ideas of healing, possibility, wholeness, uh, health, beauty, connection, gratitude, uh, now regeneration and healing of our, of our earth. That's kind of a, a lot of the context of my, my past. You mentioned Landmark there and the plant medicine. I want to get into those. But before we do, to create a little bit more context of the situation growing up, I know your dad and your mom, they were both twins, and they ended up marrying. It was two pairs of twins that ended up getting married. Close. And it was, didn't, it was, didn't it was you... brothers. So brothers married twin sisters. and we That's, all, that's we... what I meant. I might have butchered that, but that's what I meant. Yeah, yes. And we all lived in this, on this yeah, 20-acre old dairy farm in upstate New York with one bank, one shared a bank account, four adults. 
and uh, two kids. And uh, it was a pretty wild, uh, you know, especially now. I mean, it, it wasn't wild then. It was just kind of what was so. But when I tell the story, it definitely is surprising people. Another, you know, beautiful expression that kind of shares the, just the evolution of my parents and their capacity for love and forgiveness and healing is my parents got divorced when I was 20 and my dad remarried and my mom ended up, she's a clothing designer. She ended up designing the wedding dress for my stepmom to marry my dad and was present for the wedding. And um, they're all friends and they spend time together. And so it, I've had a really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm extremely blessed in the example that I've seen around, uh, you know, how human beings can transform the exact architecture of family and still create and still hold uh, the love and the uh, feeling of family and oneness, even though when things change and new people come in to the equation. And you mentioned at the time, you didn't really think it was wild growing up and it was just the way it was. But did you have a little bit of an inkling, like talking to your other friends, like something was a little bit different about the way you were growing up? Well, that, that's the other thing. I, I went Waldorf school. I was in a I was in a school with from first grade to to eighth grade. I had only twelve students, same teacher for those. So literally, it was the same teacher and same students, twelve students for uh, you know six seven years of my childhood. So I mean, their lunches were definitely better than mine, and that they had fruit roll ups, and I had tofu con sandwiches and uh, carob covered graham crackers, and they had gummy bears. I definitely knew that my lunch <laughs> was, uh, was not as sweet as theirs, and their crust was definitely lighter color and fluffier than mine. So, but but uh, even in that, in the Waldorf school, some of those kids, my scope of childhood um, kids was, you know, again, it was a, a small group, and some of those parents held similar philosophies to my parents. So you know, I do, I do recall, um, again, you know, food is so such a thing as a kid, what you don't like, what you do like. But going over to friends' houses and being able to have, uh, I remember one morning of having as much corn checks with a bowl of sugar on the table open to just pour on my, on my corn checks was like a dream come true. I've never had this ever happen before. Um, but Again, you, you know, you, you think these things are great, but, you know, I think that the deeper education that I got around health and, you know, the, the challenges of sugar and rotting our teeth and causing, you know, feeding inflammation and, and dairy feeding, you know, phlegm and mucus and, you know, sugar feeding candida or feeding, you know, sickness, even though there was moments of desire that I enjoyed those uh, pleasures of you know, kind of the more conventional childhood, I definitely have continued my life in really understanding the value of, you know, that I'm an ecosystem and every meal, every choice, every exercise is either strengthening the health of this ecosystem or degenerating the, the strength of this ecosystem. And I'm going to come in contact with a lot of challenging things, you know, whether pathogens, viruses, infections, diseases, you know, those things are in us, they're all around us. And how can I, you know, create the healthiest? And, you know, that that's another aspect, which, you know, sounds kind of woo woo. But I definitely grew up, you know, I, I would feel a little prickle in my throat. And I would spend time just really willing, like, I am healthy, I am strong, I am vital. Yes, I am healthy, I am strong, I am vital. Ah! You know, like, I, I would, I would get into these states of, you know, my mentality around being able to defend off and I'd feel something coming on and be able to, you know, beat it out before it kind of took took over. And that's been my experience. Uh, again, I got no scientific backing, but that's been my experience for most of my life is being able to self-regulate my health through, you know, sleep, mental mind state, meditation, yoga, exercise gratitude, you know, good loving relationships, you know, and I get these things are all, you know, privilege, you know, they're, they're a privilege and they've been cultivated and, you know, part of the blessing of my lineage. But, uh, you know, that has been my experience is that 
you know, I'm 40 years old and I'm healthy. I, I, I don't get sick. I'm resilient even when, you know, things, you know, there is a lot to be infected by. Yeah. So again, that's just kind of baked into my experience of life. And again, it's not just food, it's, it's mindset and practice and just overall understanding that my body, as I said in the beginning, my body's an ecosystem and how can I give it all the proper support so that it can do what it's supposed to do and uh, defend off the things that might try to um, create some imbalance. And other than binging on sugar and cereal at a friend's house, did you have a period of time through your teens or through your childhood where you would rebel against the ways of your parents? You know, my sister was the great rebel. So she really modeled the major rebel. So I then rebelled against her rebel, which then kind of had me fall back towards more my my parents' mentality. But I would say that my great rebel, because my parents were like, okay, with my sister smoking pot at the house, you know, when she was younger. I mean, it's a true story, and this is probably funny, but they knew she was going to go out and explore doing LSD. And they said, instead of going out and doing it somewhere where we're not, you're not safe and, you know, something could happen, we know you're going to do it. So we're just going to create an environment where you're going to do it uh, in the safety of, and again, I, as a parent, I'm not sure <laughs> how I'll how I'll follow in their footsteps around that. How old was she at the time? I was probably 16 years old. Yeah, 16 or 17 years old. So yeah, I, I rebelled against. I, I I got into like uh, you know straight edge hardcore. I was into skateboarding. I had you know X's you know X's on my fists and was you know renunciated the kind of you know smoking pot thing, drinking thing, and so I, I definitely had a period where I was, yeah, rebelled against their kind of liberal nature to the exploration of substances and was totally like no alcohol, no weed. So that was probably from like 13 through probably 18 was like very, and that, that was actually another unique aspect of my childhood was that I saw that I picked up on the pattern early on in life that people would rely on substance, alcohol mostly, or weed to have fun or to feel loose or to feel comfortable to talk or to, to interact, to dance. And so I, I had this early kind of challenge in my life of how can I be comfortable in my own skin um, without the dependence on some kind of substance. And so I would always put myself in kind of environments where I wasn't like wanted or I wasn't normal or what I was kind of a little bit of an outcast or I wasn't kind of the standard my way of being or my conversation that I was coming with and I, I would try to like create bridges and be a bridge builder and not need whether it was going to like a, a fraternity that was like mostly black and Puerto Rican fraternity at Cornell campus and could I go and you know show up on the dance floor and feel you know comfortable enough to like I'm going to be here and I'm going to be in my body. I'm going to dance and I'm not going to depend on alcohol to find comfort. And how do I kind of bridge the awkwardness of interacting, whether it was like age gaps, cultural, in, or like, you know, a lot of my friends would be like, never wanting to talk to the adults or the parents. And I would always be like, all right, like I'm going to dive in with these adults and like try to become connected. So I was always trying to figure out, and I think that also comes from I had learning disabilities going into school and I couldn't read or write that well, but I had a lot of emotional intelligence and I was always using kind of my emotional intelligence to, you know, survive or to thrive or to, you know, to kind of connect and, you know, create relationships with people such that I could, you know, belong or fit in or be enough in the world. And there was, you know, a piece around the, the drugs thing, which I noticed that people were depending on substances to make those those connections, whether it was just comfortable to open up to their emotions or, you know, talking about things that are real. And so I, I had a, a strong commitment to not having to depend on substances and kind of lean into finding my emotional and human connection without those things. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Ryland to give a shout out to my show partner, Organifi. Right now, the limited edition Organifi Gold Pumpkin Spice is available. 
It's back for a limited time. It's an incredible nighttime tea made with delicious flavors of fall. This all-organic pumpkin spice superfood tea delivers a warm rush of sweet, autumn-inspired joy. You'll find no added sugar, syrup, whipped cream, or anything artificial here. This is the healthiest pumpkin spice treat you'll ever savor. It contains turmeric, ginger, reishi mushroom, lemon balm, turkey tail mushroom, magnesium, piperine from black pepper that helps with turmeric absorption, coconut milk, Ceylon cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, and allspice. It's organic, gluten-free, vegan, soy-free, and keto-friendly, which are all labels I love to see on a product. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Get stocked up with the Organifi Gold Pumpkin Spice today. It's only available for a limited time. Now I'm going to give a shout out to my other show partner, Blue Blocks. Blue Blocks makes the best blue light glasses, and they relatively recently came out with the Lumi light bulbs. They have the Lumi Sleep Plus bulbs that are low EMF, zero flicker, and zero blue and green light for after sunset use. Blue light passing through your eyes is only part of the problem. Blue light hitting your skin at night can mess with your sleep and circadian rhythms. So if you're looking for next level blue light protection, the Lumi Sleep Plus bulbs are your solution. They also have the Lumi Summer Glow bulbs. These are low blue light bulbs for daytime use. They produce a warm yellow glow that mimics the summer's day, instantly elevating your mood. And as a listener of the show, you get 15% off your Blue Blocks purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Blue Blocks. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Blue Blocks. And Blue Blocks is spelled B-L-U-B-L-O-X. On top of that, Blue Blocks also offers free shipping worldwide for orders over $100. The Lumi light bulbs are the perfect solution to our modern day lighting problems. Get yours today. And now back to my chat with Rylan. And what came first, Landmark or the plant medicine? Right around the same time for the first, the first interaction, I did Landmark the summer after I graduated high school, so 18 years old. Did it in, the New, York, in New York City in the, in the World Trade Towers before they fell. And I took a Greyhound bus up to New York City by myself at 18, which is kind of a big deal. And again, my parents pretty trusting, like, oh, he's going to get on a Greyhound bus and go to New York City and uh, just get off at Port Authority, figure out how to get to a second cousin's house who I was going to stay with, you know, while I was going to the landmark course. But yeah, that was, that was quite profound in really getting at a deep level how much at an ontological deep level how much human beings are similar and that we're all afraid of each other. We're all trying to look good and make it. And we're pretending that we have it all together and we don't. And really that adults don't have it all together and really getting like, wow, it's really just all made up, isn't it? And there's all these kind of like, oh, they they wear that kind of suit jacket. They must know all these things. And oh, that person drives that car. Oh, that person came from that place. Oh, they're talking. They must know each other. Like we're meaning making machines. We we make up so many things, but oftentimes what we make up is constraints that limit our possibility, limit our view of, you know, what we can do or what is possible for ourselves based on our past experiences. And, you know, there's a beautiful metaphor where if you put a flea in a canning jar and the, the flea will bounce up and hit its head and he'll want to stop hitting his head because it hurts. Um, so it'll just start bouncing below the lid and you can pop the lid off and the flea will continue to bounce below the lid. And that as a human being, we're, we're oftentimes like that. We hit our heads a couple of times through growing up and being, you know, chastised or, you know, made wrong or, you know, abused or made fun of or laughed at. And then, you know, we become, we're shy, you know, we're an introvert, we're this. And, you know, that's just a, you know, a reaction to some circumstances that then, you know, shape some survival, you know, way of being. And then we just, you know, conform to that and, you know, to go through landmark and see people so fixed on who they are and they're so righteous about what's limiting them and who they are and what they're not and, you know, what this thing is. And, and then just by the end, just laughing at themselves in their fixed perspective that was just holding them in 
bondage for their own smallness or their own limitation and then just being able to point at that personality that that walked in that friday you know before the sunday of the weekend workshop and just to see people unveiling and telling the truth about you know what kind of limitations they've been living with and that that's really been a story that has been mostly living in their mind only is so powerful and for you specifically what limitations did you go in there with knowing or unknowing and then coming out how were you different i didn't go to college because i thought i was too stupid to survive in the working world anybody who had any kind of in anything that was to do with business or academia or just the world of learning and even just at early on like you know growing up into you know starting a business structure that i could you know be a leader and i could create something that people would want it was just i, I just had such a a limiting view of myself because i really had a story that i was stupid um because i could read at a fifth grade level you know had a little bit of dyslexia so i'd flip words around and and so that just created a real limitation for anything that i you know or many things that i would even venture into exploring when i went through landmark and then you know obviously i continued to participate but really there was a huge just opening around oh, wow it is all made up i can create things and i can make up stories that empower my skill set and my limitations and that i can create awesome things and i can actually be a catalyst for being a leader in the world and i can create change and i can interact with people who have lots of money and i can interact with business people who wear suits and i can articulate things intelligently enough to where people will want to participate so it really was a foundational breakthrough around i had basically labeled everything that i was afraid of failing at and afraid that i would be inept to intellectually participate in that i basically i labeled those things as i was disinterested and i just kind of blew that whole story up and started to see how much more that i could be doing in life and you know that turned into you know my career of becoming an entrepreneur where you know me and my sister opened up a recording studio with no skills and ran that for you know three and a half years in hollywood and had a whole chapter there and then that had me have the belief that I could go and learn the restaurant business in a year and come back to LA. And it ended up taking me five and a half years to, you know, come back to LA, but we ended up coming back to LA and opening restaurants there. And then, you know, to uh, the moment where I, you know, learned about soil and regeneration and regenerative agriculture in New Zealand, um, or even backing up from that, like I made another film that you may have heard of called May I Be Frank, which was a film about a transformational film about a guy who walks into Cafe Gratitude and we say, you want to take on, you know, healing your body, healing your mind, healing your relationships and allow us to coach you and be your transformational cheerleaders and support you and help mentor you down a path of healing. And this guy, Frank Ferrante says yes. And, you know, he goes through this remarkable healing. And he's now, you know, he's still a friend of mine. He's still in my life and lives in Sedona and speaks at health conferences. And and he's lost a ton of weight and healed a lot of his relationships with his family that were totally broken and got himself off antidepressants after 10 years of dependency. And, and you know, obviously our interaction with him was, you know, one step of the journey that continues to happen. But it was absolutely a catalyst that completely change the trajectory of his life so it's a great film oh yeah cool is that one on netflix as well uh that's not on netflix that's on um that's on hulu gotcha so this will be your first go at netflix that's right yeah the beast of netflix that's right yeah uh so again i've always been someone who's been inspired about uh creating movements um whether it's health food gratitude i have a tattoo on my arm that says be love for a while there, I was creating a movement where, you know, lots of people were getting beloved tattoos. We actually, uh, at my wedding, uh, we had tattoo artists giving beloved tattoos as the party favor, as the kind of thinking was, it's like, uh, in life, we're going to have amnesia a lot of times about what this life is all about. And the most fundamental remembrance would be like, oh, who I'm being matters. 
and who I choose to be is love. And to be love is always a choice and that doesn't cost anything. And that's always, we can be 100% responsible that we have the autonomy and the ability to be the presence of love. And, you know, obviously our, our great teachers and avatars and, you know, spiritual figures have mentored that and, 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 and exemplified that. But that was meant to be lived by us common folk, too. That was, that was the aspiration, that we get to realize that Christ consciousness, that we get to realize that Buddha consciousness, that we get to be that peace, that love. And that love is an indwelling presence within our hearts. And it's not found in people, places, and things. It's something that is be. We get to, we get to choose who we're being. And to be love is a choice. And so that was kind of my first, my first movement was like the being love movement, the be love movement. And didn't your dad get the same tattoos at the same time? Yeah, we went and got him. We got him together after doing uh, a new warrior training, a men's work uh, in the, the hills in Santa Cruz. And it was about connecting with kind of a transformed vision of masculinity and what could masculine, what kind of masculinity could we live and exemplify in our lives. And kind of the message that I got was love is oftentimes seen as like a, a, a feminine nurturing thing. And I was like, wow, it's, it's powerful. And it's, it's, it, it is masculine to, to stand in where I am. Love is, and that love is an unmesswithable force. And when we're connected to that love is a, a source from within, you know, that's a, that's a powerful, beautiful expression of masculinity. And that was kind of my commitment to taking that on. A common theme I'm noticing here is that there's this close knit family tie with so much that happens in your life with the tattoo, with the working together. And something that I want to talk about right now, at 19, doing ayahuasca with your parents. So take <laughs> us back to the plant medicine and what that whole experience was like and how, how that came to be. Yeah. So at the time I was living in San Francisco, I was working as a kind of maintenance guy at a, a company called redladder.com, a tech company in the early dot com era of San Francisco. And I was kind of in a, a little bit of a, a mental crisis around because I didn't go to college. I didn't become a pro snowboarder. I didn't get into that, but I was kind of aspiring to become a pro snowboarder. And I uh, moved to Lake Tahoe for a couple of years and I didn't see that, that being the future of my life. And, you know, I was kind of thinking like, oh, should I get into computer technology? It seems like that's what all young people are doing. I was, you know, at this, at this moment and my parents were like, hey, we'd love to take you to this kind of meditation experience where we're going to go in the Redwoods and we're going to drink this tea and the tea has kind of a psychoactive effect and it brings you into a deep, deep state of um, communion with nature, with life, with, with God. And it's a, a beautiful way to remember, you know, who you are and, you know, what's important to you. And they had done it once, one time before this, and uh, they wanted uh, me to experience it with them. They were going to do it with uh, a group. Called, it's a, it's a, a group that actually took the plant medicine all the way to the Supreme Court to get it as a legal sacrament as part of a religious ceremony. You know, we went to this place in the Marin Headlands in a grove of redwoods, and um, it's connected to a, you know, kind of a, a Christian uh, lineage of spirituality, but it's also been kind of combined with Brazilian mysticism and shamanism and the way that I think actually that whole kind of church that came into existence was around there was a um a rubber tapper that was down kind of doing i don't know if it was slave or like migrant work in brazil harvesting rubber trees and had the opportunity of sitting with a shaman and drinking the plant medicine ayahuasca and again my story might not be exactly exactly but the divine mother came to him and maybe even christ came to him and said this is a way that people can remember God, remember Christ. And so bring this back to your communities. And he ended up bringing that back to the United States and turning it into part of the sacramental ceremony of the service and that you can take the plant medicine. And so I participated in that probably it was like a group of, you know, 20 people. And um, he drank this very dark, bitter tea. 
And in this case, you know, we had these little hymn books of kind of these Portuguese hymns that are half kind of like Icaro, kind of traditional uh, shamanistic shaman songs from, you know, South America, and then merged with sort of some Christian uh, chants of, of Jesus. And so we're kind of taking take on, you know, you're having this experience and it feels like something's kind of taking over the body and the mind and your and your your kind of your ego and your mind is like trying to hold on to control and it, it, you know you you can tell that there's a death is coming of the of the control and there's a call for surrender and um we're all dressed in white and um singing stepping two steps to the left two steps to the right and singing these these songs and there's this huge experience happening inside and you know ultimately what that experience led me to was this profound experience of sort of me asking the question what am i what am i here to do and i kind of the internal question of should i get into computer technology and start working for a dot com in san francisco i really saw the way of being and the energy and how that could look of being kind of plugged into technology as like life and that there was just a depletion of my existence if if I would do that. And really then I saw this kind of split screen of instead of my hands kind of plugged into technology, my hands plugged into the earth and, you know, the roots and the soil and my shoulder as the mountain, you know, having this experience of feeling the hum and the, the vibrancy of the pulse of life of Mother Earth and seeing that world that I was a part of in that circle, seeing it from the vantage point of the red tailed hawk that was flying above, seeing it from the perspective of the ground beneath our feet, seeing it from the perspective of the energy that was, you know, kind of coming in and communicating with all the, these people um, in this meditation. And really just got profoundly connected to that. My life was about and for caring for and protecting and stewarding the earth, you know, and that was, yeah, that was 18 and 19. So that was almost 20 years before I founded Kiss the Ground, um, which again is even a more explicit, clear sort of role and instruction of what I'm doing. Why am I here? What's my service? How can I serve Mother Earth? How can I serve, you know, all? Uh, the inhabitants of Mother Earth. And again, you know, there's always been this call of like, how do I be an expression of love? And, you know, there's always been a conflict of, I wish I was like a musician that I could talk about love and, you know, love for the earth. Or I wish I was a poet that could write the poetry that would articulate. Uh, or I wish I, you know, somehow my, my never really found what my art was to express this expression. And then, you know, it really just came through building community and entrepreneurship and building businesses that were embodiments of this philosophy and way of being that had been so kind of sewn into the fiber of my being, you know, through many different layers and many different influences. But, uh, you know, I would say that, you know, part of why, you know, for eight years, I've been an unmess withable energetic lightning rod for uh, regeneration, soil health, uh, regenerative agriculture, interbeing, that regeneration can be this new North Star for humanity and that we can, you know, we can shift in consciousness and that we are shifting in consciousness. And, you know, the idea of what is the big shift? Is it going to be like, oh, we're going to just all feel peace or we're all going to feel love? I don't know that that's, that's what it, but I could see and I still see. And that's what's kind of, you know, that's pulling me forward is really seeing people connected to this idea that there is this deep interconnection with all of life with nature and that the way we manage our resources manage land do agriculture you know ultimately the way we do everything but specifically agriculture as a very clear modeling for the regenerative philosophy and the regenerative architecture of how our participation can enhance the function of a living ecosystem and you know love love and regeneration are very you know those have been two big themes in my life which love is like i love you pass it on love love only wants for its essence to be experienced and felt 
by another and it's not longing for give it back to me because it knows where it's giving it's part of that place and so regeneration is the same thing like i'm giving my leaves for fertilization i, I don't want to give those leaves for fertilization for the next tree over no it, it knows that it's part of a it's part of a whole and it, it gives knowing that it's giving to its wholeness not uh, it's giving to some other part that I'm not sure if I'm going to get my part back. So one thing that comes to me hearing your ayahuasca story and this connection to the earth and nature, it's interesting because that happened when you were 18, 19. And then I know the recording studio with your sister happened after that. So it's almost like that was a little bit of a pivot from the epiphany you had on the plant medicine. So I'm curious how that fits in. Even though the plant medicine gave me this deep, profound, can never shake the remembrance of that feeling and that experience and that call, I didn't know how to materialize that. You know, it's one of the things I loved about, what was that book? There was a beautiful book about kind of how plant medicine and microdosing has become so big in Silicon Valley and kind of with entrepreneurs and but you know, one of the, the, the pitfalls is like you have this experience and you think that you are and you can do what you saw or experience the next day, whereas you might experience the fulfillment of something that is a carrot of possibility or the fulfillment of an experience that will take your lifetime to accomplish. And that the, the integration and the pitfalls can be like you think, oh, I, I had this supreme de de download. I'm now an avatar. I'm a spiritual teacher, I'm a guru, I'm a, I'm a shaman, you know, and you may experience the fulfillment of something that may take, you know, years of chop wood, carry water to integrate and actually realize. The, going back to the recording studio, really, that was from my sister, you know, my sister had a, a, a crisis. Um, she was going to be, you know, that's another whole story. She was going to be tried for manslaughter because she was part of a drug deal, a marijuana drug deal gone bad, and people ended up getting shot. So I went down there to kind of be with her and, and help her through a really traumatic moment in life. And then based on my parents' inability to be there for her at that time, and me having to be there and really you know devote myself to my sister, she was in that world of recording studio. So it just made sense that we kind of went down that path. But again, even even there, I was giving people herbal remedies and we were turning people on to, you know, plant based food and chlorophyll and golden seal and colloidal silver. And I was in my little sort of medicine man shamanism at a very small level in that context. So it was still there, but it just wasn't again, it hadn't really fully realized into the, the full actualization of, you know, what I was doing with my life, even though there was still aspects of service and bringing plants in as medicines for humans at that time. I see. So the threat of hippiness was there throughout the whole journey. Yeah, I was just a hip hop hippie. Gotcha. I had a little Puerto Rican chin strap and I wore uh, velour jumpsuits, Sean John velour jump jumpsuits. And, uh, you know, I just got very hip hop in my hippie. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with Ryland to give a shout out to our show partner, Perfect Keto. The Perfect Keto Keto Bars are a perfect snack to have on hand when hunger strikes in between meals. They're a decadent, keto-friendly snack bar with only 3 grams of net carbs and no added sugar, sugar alcohols, additives, or fillers. They come in 6 flavors, cinnamon roll, birthday cake, chocolate chip cookie dough, salted caramel, almond butter brownie, and lemon poppy seed. So there's a flavor out there for everyone's palate. These bars are hearty, delicious, and satisfying, and I personally love and highly recommend the chocolate chip cookie dough flavor. They're incredible. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Perfect Keto products ship worldwide, and you get free shipping if you live in the U.S. and you spend over $29. Get yourself some of the Perfect Keto Keto bars. You don't need to be on a ketogenic diet to enjoy them. And now back to my chat with Ryland. You've experienced a lot of life in this 40 years years, which is incredible. I have. Um, so go through the story here. You end up leaving the recording studio and you, you go to Cafe Gratitude. We talked about that briefly, but let's now talk about soil and regenerative agriculture. 
You mentioned you got into this about seven or eight years ago. How did this come about? Yeah, so I got invited to go to New Zealand to speak at a conference called the Healthy Living Expo in New Zealand. So the first of its kind. And I went there to give a, a workshop on sacred commerce. So, and I went there to kind of teach, to, uh, talk about what Cafe Gratitude was up to as a business and plant-based food. And also we were going to go do a couple screenings of May I Be Frank. Um, so again, you know, the, the restaurant, the film kind of brought me to this place, New Zealand, where I found myself in a audience of a panel discussion called Can Human Beings Sustain Themselves on Planet Earth? And five out of the six experts said no, that, you know, we're too far gone and that, you know, it's actually worse than we're being told because if we're apathetic, nonprofits can't raise money, environmental groups can't raise money. That was a, a very kind of depressing and eye opening moment. Um, but what was even more eye opening was a guy by the name of Graham Sate, who was a soil sort of expert. He uh, trained farmers and agronomists all around the world on the principles and practices of ecological agriculture or nutrition farming is what he calls it. This is pre the word regenerative agriculture being like a, a generally used in the lexicon of language term. But basically he says he does a talk about how humus, humus, which is healthy soil, how humus can save the, save the world. And basically talks about, you know, we don't have more carbon now than we did 200 million years ago. Carbon is always cycling through these different pools, and we've just created an imbalance of carbon up in the upper atmosphere, and that's happened before, whether it was when volcanoes erupted or an asteroid hit, but the way that the planet got balanced was photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the driver of our climate, and basically, agriculture can go from the industry that's maybe the, the biggest destroyer of our planet to actually the great redeemer and that everyone who eats can participate in helping farmers and ranchers heal and regenerate the planet. And it was just like, oh, I mean, I've been an organic, vegan activist toting, you know, all the best talking points about sustainability. And I had never heard this ever. I just did not get the way that plants and trees and photosynthesis works is that it's sipping carbon out of the atmosphere all the time. It builds itself, it, the grass stalk or the tree, but then it, it shares 30 to 70% of its carbon sugars with microorganisms in the ground. And those microorganisms give the plant mineral nutrients. And in exchange, they give it for sugar. It's a brokering deal. I give you sugar, carbon, carbohydrates, carbon hydrogen. I'll give you minerals in the soil from the rock compounds, the geology. I'll turn that into a biologically accessible nutrients. And that's how the exchange of plants works of up, uptaking nutrients. And if we could see that all plants and agriculture and the way that we manage land could be an ally and a, a tool for sequestering and drawing down carbon, we could actually reverse the, obviously we have to re reduce our emissions. We can't just continue to burn emissions and, you know, think that we can just, suck. no, but if we, if we reduce, stop, you know, burning all those emissions, we already have 250, uh, you know, uh, is it, what is it? 410, 15 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. You know, the ocean has absorbed probably 75% of that and, you know, keeping things, you know, where we are today, but the ocean's, you know, saturated, it's acidifying. We're losing phytoplankton, but the soil is the big opportunity. The soil still has got a lot of vacancy, a lot of room. It's a big storage shed that we could pull a bunch of that excess carbon and we could actually heal our soils. We could glue our soils back together with carbon glues by this problem up in the atmosphere and make it a solution here in the ground. I was just like, bing, 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 bing. It was like a, a, it was like a, a casino jackpot of spiritual awakening in my heart and mind when I saw this kind of these these dots being connected. And I just thought that is the most compelling, hopeful, biggest opportunity that I've ever seen in life, in all my years of life. That is so inspiring. So I, I got back to Cafe Gratitude and running restaurants and I would just be this evangelist for soil. Everywhere I went, I was just 
sharing, sharing, sharing about soil. And, and people would be like, well, how do I learn more? I was like, well, look up Graham Sadie's on YouTube probably. And then I was starting to look where I was sending people. And at the time, his talks on YouTube were very bad camera angle, bad, you know, kind of old slides, you know, an hour and a half. He has a pretty thick accent. I was like, oh, wow, the general person is not going to get through to this. This is a problem. You know, be the change we wish to see in the world. I just saw it was like it was like that. It was that opening of space. I saw, all right, step in. You, you live in Los Angeles. You live in the storytelling capital of the world. You've already seen how you can tell a story with Cafe Gratitude and you know, change perception and you can bring something out of the, main, the margins into the mainstream. So we just started literally gathering people in my living room every Monday for a year, just volunteers. How are we going to change the paradigm of thinking and get people to understand this opportunity? Because, you know, at the time, it wasn't really on Bill McKibben's, you know, radar. It wasn't really on Al Gore's radar. And, you know, maybe they had heard about it, but it just, there wasn't the science, there wasn't the lexicon and the distilled talking points that had it be a real viable solution. So even like, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, like the experts of the, the climate change world hadn't grokked this at a, at a scale. And it just became like our responsibility. All right, we're going to get this conversation to the masses. And that's the game that we're playing. And, you know, we've been kind of unstoppable in doing that. And, you know, again, fast forward to the film, it's so beautifully intertwined and the miracles of synchronicity. But I came back from New Zealand and I'm living uh, in Venice and I'm looking for a place to move into because I was just staying with a friend. And there, a friend of mine has a, a, a little two bedroom bungalow where his friends are moving out and they're environmental filmmakers. And they move out, they move to Ojai on their way out. I'm like, do you guys know about soil? Uh, you guys should make a film about regenerative agriculture and uh, how it could be a solution to climate change. And they were like, yeah, yeah, no, we make films about oil and oil is hard enough to make films that people care about. Soil, that's even a more boring topic. Their names are Josh and Rebecca Tikal. And they ended up calling me six months later and were like, hey, we actually had somebody else proposition us you know, around making a film about soil. And we're a little intrigued and we see that you guys are building this nonprofit around this whole narrative and education and advocacy around the topic of regenerative agriculture and its solution. We'd like to partner with you. And so we ended up partnering almost seven years ago to start making this film uh, called Kiss the Ground, that here we are uh, at the, the moment where it launches out. So it really is like the mission of our organization is people being awakened to the possibilities of regeneration. And, you know, everything is, you know, our North Star is always driving us. How, how can we have the greatest impact of people being awakened to this possibility? And, uh, you know, this film and the ambassadorship around this film and all the, you know, people behind this film, uh, I really feel like we are going to get a collective mind shift that we are going to go from kind of the early adopters into like a broader scale of adoption that this is a viable, real solution that we all need to be starting to work and aim towards because it really is something that gives so much hope and possibility and unification at a moment when there's a lot of divide. You guys definitely did an amazing job with the film and you made Dirt interesting. And I know it's going to really impact so many people and be part of this, this powerful change. But one thing we need to talk about before I let you go is this whole regenerative agriculture story that you just told. Everything fits together so nicely and all the work you're doing is so incredible. But part of regenerative agriculture is including animals in the farming process. Yes. And Cafe Gratitude is a plant-based, <laughs> yes, yes, a plant-based grazing animal. So in Cafe Gratitude, obviously a plant-based organic restaurant, you talked about being a vegan advocate. Talk about the response at Cafe Gratitude and in your own personal life when you started talking about, you know, incorporating animals into the whole farming scheme. That was a big disruption and a big um, kind of, and, and again, we, we, we didn't know it was coming. You know, it started pretty benevolent. We were vegan, vegans, and I've been vegetarian for most of my whole life. Uh, we bought a, bought a farm in Vacaville, and we started, um, especially my father, mainly was 
growing vegetables for uh, our restaurants in San Francisco, for our vegan raw restaurants in San Francisco. And as we started to dig into biodynamics, you know, how to create a regenerative effect on a piece of land uh, so that nature continues to thrive under an agricultural system, because we definitely, we create some fairy tales around farming and agriculture. It's just like very natural thing. No, agriculture is actually, you know, for the most part, what it's turned into is a very unnatural thing. It's, you know, it's us taking natural land and turning a biodiversity of crops into one crop and basically stopping anything from eating what's hap- you know on that land because we want to eat what's on that land and so it becomes about protecting from nature and separating what we want from the rest of nature so that we can kind of control it manipulate it and you know it really is like agriculture is a lot become almost like turning nature into a mechanism or a machine and that's really what monoculture agriculture you know mimics and so when we started to think about how can we grow food sustainably, organically, biodynamically, um, you know, we started interviewing and working with farmers and, you know, becoming mentored by different people who've been working on soil health. And we started to see how, you know, nature has an architecture of life and death. And in that life and death, there is no waste, but there is a continuum of a system that maintains balance that maintains you know a continual sort of um, ecosystem level health and it's always self-regulating for this balance but there's a, a proliferation of you know continuous health that is happening in that system that requires no inputs from some other place and so as we started to see how we could create a farming sim and farming system that mimics nature we started to really understand the way grassland was created was through hooved herbivores grazing and um, rotating over land and that that was what had created the great soils of the world that was being mined for current day agriculture so to create a continuation a regenerative a sustainable a regenerative agriculture, it became very clear that animals were were absolute essential partners or um, components, part of that architecture to have a continuum of a healthy system. You know, as we started to learn, you know, we had cows on the system because we were bringing in, you know, cow manure by the, you know, the gob loads from some local dairy. But then, you know, like that dairy you know, the values and ethics of that dairy, those animals were being poorly treated. You know, there's chemical inputs, you know, there was a lot of confinement, and yet we're needing a byproduct from that system to make our system work. That didn't seem right or healthy or, you know, sustainable or, or, or ethical. We started to see, okay, well, how if we had animals on the land, how could they fit into the, because again, a farm is a business. A farm is it's an economic business model that allows for an individual to live, you know, from the land, you know, producing crops that are able to sustain, you know, that farming ecosystem economically. And so having cows in the system, you know, okay, yeah, they could just eat from the grass, but, you know, how does it work as a, you know, everything is a give and take, everything needs to bring something to the table. And so we ended up having uh make getting into raw milk and milking the cows and making cheese but still we weren't you know killing any of the cows because we were vegetarians and then we had a couple cows that uh one had a a blood disease and one another one was a full-grown male and you know my dad made the choice to um you know he wanted to look this process you know right in the face and you know with his own awareness go through the process of that life and death cycle, you know, he brought that cow into this world, you know, stewarded its life and had a great life, and then was going to steward its process of, you know, transition. You know, we went through that process, you know, as a, you know, just humbly, all right, we're going to, we're going to take ourselves through this process. And it was a very confronting and, uh, you know, brought tears to our eyes and was hard, but 
to understand the threads of all the sacrifice, the life and death that leads to you know what we consume on a daily basis. We we oftentimes don't have to look at that, and so we were just going through the process of how can we be the most responsible stewards of the land and see this process all the way through. Again, we're on a learning journey. We don't. This is what we know so far. You know what we knew to that point. To this point is that you know to create health on a, on a piece of land. You know to set up a, a farming system. You know part of that system is going to rely on animal partnership and you know animals that will be living and dying as part of that system. Just like there's living and dying of you know the plant kingdom or you know earthworms or you know, nematodes or microorganisms or, you know, that the, there is life and death in the system. And instead of looking at just one death, looking at can we have a, a system where, yes, there's life and death, but there's actually overall year after year, there's more life holding capacity in that farming system. That's kind of the exploration and journey that we've been on. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where it started. And so we've, you know, one of my favorite things is David Bronner says, who's a proud vegan and also a supporter of regenerative agriculture, is that vegans have an amazing, amazing discipline. You know, they're disciplined about what they eat and what they don't eat, and that's amazing and admirable. And, you know, people who are working in the space of regenerative agriculture are looking at how we can produce food while regenerating ecosystems, and they really understand ecosystem function. So we've got stuff to learn from, you know, people who pioneering farmers and ranchers who are working on the regeneration of, you know, life and land and soil and, you know, and stewarding animals in a way uh, where they have a good dignified life throughout their life. And, you know, there's, there's lots of things that we as vegans or people who are, you know, committed to animal welfare and people who are committed to healing our planet and doing regenerative agriculture in a way to produce food and also uh, heal our, our broken landscapes there's a lot of virtue in both sides and we need to come together and agree on what we can agree upon and allow for, you know, that we're going to have different opinions across the board, but can we agree that we're both wanting to make the world a better place and wanting to make life for animals better as well. One thing you guys definitely had to deal with at the time was some blowback from the vegan community. Talk about what went on there and how you moved through it. It really was, um, it, it was definitely a, a pretty confronting moment. We had, you know, we had a lot of, you know, protesters and people calling my family murderers. And it was a pretty intense moment. Even my, my parents got a couple of death threats on their, uh, to their phone. And so that was, uh, pretty intense, um, you know, coming from the compassionate community. And I get it. I get that we, we had a role of kind of like, you know, mom and dad figures, uh, parental figures, leaders in the plant-based movement. And, you know, it's never fun to have your your investment in people who are doing something that, you know, aligns with your ideology and your, your vision. And then those people make a pivot. It can be shocking and can be confronting. You can feel like a betrayal. I get it. I understand the disappointment. But I think where I always want to lean people towards is like, you know, we're on our journey, you know, we're, we're human beings having a, a journey in this life, learning about, you know, different aspects of how to be better, how to, how to eat, how to live, how to be kind, compassionate, uh, beneficial humans. And, you know, this is a learning process. And, you know, we're just telling the truth about our process and going through our process. And in another 20 years, I may have a different philosophy or a different view. This is where we are today. This is what we've learned. This makes sense from a, a deep understanding of, you know, even studying and understanding, you know, indigenous cultures and their view around animals as, you know, part of their diet, but also part of their life that like, yeah, we can actually be reverent and so grateful for the life of an animal because it actually sustains our life. And it is the, the substance that gives us life. And that is, again, just in the way that we're grateful for vegetables for sustaining our life. There is a, an ability to have reverence for you know, that which we consume that will die, but ultimately doesn't die because it, it, the energy of it becomes our life. And there's so much to be grateful for in that. And can we do that? You know, can we have that attitude of reverence and appreciation? You know, I love Wendell Berry said, 
Every day we break the body and spill the blood of creation. If we do it knowingly, carefully, and reverently, it is a sacrament. If we do it with greed, gluttony, and clumsiness, it is a desecration. And again, not to say that I'm always awake and, and reverent for everything that you know is living and dying, such that my I can have a, a you know a life and an existence. But you know that's the practice: is can we can we be in gratitude for all that is living and dying, such that we can have life for the time being that we have life, and can we support systems that are thinking and caring for you know that whole system and wanting that system to actually get better and actually be a system that'll be healthy in two generations, three generations forward. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And we need to align around those things that we can align around and allow for our differing opinions to be okay that we're going to have different opinions. And you mentioned there you're a vegetarian. Your diet's still primarily plant-based, right? Yeah. My, my diet, you know, I had a first hamburger at 35 years old of the cow that we had, that we had killed as part of uh, that process of, I'm going to experience that process fully and, you know, take in and appreciate that, that life that we had taken. But again, I, I don't have a, a big craving and desire for um, meat. I still feel really good and healthy on a mostly plant-based diet. And if I, if I know some really high quality, you know, meat has been harvested by someone who really has cared for it and offers it to me, I'll take part and appreciate it and enjoy it. Ryland, I know you got to go. I'm, I want to respect that. But I want to give major props to Kiss the Ground. Phenomenal documentary. So exciting that we're on the cusp of it being released to the world. By the time this comes out, like we talked about before, it's already going to be on Netflix for a week. So other than people checking that out, how can they connect with you after the show? Yeah. So please check us out at Kiss the Ground, uh, our Instagram, kisstheground.com. We have an amazing, amazing tool called Find Your Path. And it's designed for anyone, anywhere to put in your interests and where you are, and it basically gives you, kicks you out a feedback loop of actions that you can take to support the regenerative movement. Really jump down the rabbit hole of uh, how you can be a supporter and part of the regenerative revolution. Uh, so that's the first thing is find your path. Obviously, go watch the film on Netflix, share that film with your friends, you know, follow Kiss the Ground on Instagram, donate to our programs. We have an amazing farmland program that puts farmers through our, yeah, like that. We didn't even get into that, the whole nonprofit, our, what our programs are. We have, we have a whole program around creating advocacy for people all around the world. We've trained 3,000 people in 25 countries all around the world to be kind of active advocates in their communities around how to speak about and be about the regenerative movement. We also have a farmland program that takes farmers through a three-year transition program. Um, so we have about just under 100 farmers wanting to come into that program. So we need funds to uh, allow those farmers to take that transition. Um, so, so support our, our programs. Go to your farmer's market and meet some farmers and ask them how they care for their soil. And you know, find farmers that are passionate about taking care of their soil and regenerating their soil and start propping those farmers up and making those farmers famous, making them heroes that they ought to be and buying food from them uh, and having them win so that more farmers want to you know, follow those farmers down a successful economic as well as environmental path. Those are the things off the top of mind. And then start a garden. That's nothing more fulfilling than you know, growing your own food and caring for life and starting to see what it takes to cultivate life. And you have just a much more appreciation for food um, and where it comes from than how much it takes to produce. And then you know, compost. Make sure that what we take out of the natural environment as human beings, we steward back into the natural environment. So that's another, another thing to, to figure out how to do. And there's a, an organization called makesoil.com or .org uh, that we highly recommend. It's also on the Find Your Path tool. So those are some things, highlights, and uh, this has been really great. And thank you so much for a great conversation. Appreciate you. Oh, everything's going to be linked up in the show notes. And Rylan, keep doing the beautiful, important work you're doing. It's much appreciated and it's really making a change in the world. So thank you. Thank you. I had such a fun time chatting with Ryland. I hope you enjoyed it as well. And we'd love to hear from you over on Instagram. You can tag Love Being Ryland and Ultimate Health Podcast. And you can take a screenshot of the players you're listening or take a short video clip or picture. And we'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 372. We have links to everything we discussed today and so much more. So be sure and check that out. 
And before I let you go, I want to give some love to our editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jay, thanks for being a member of the team. You're much appreciated. And this week's fun fact is that we had our friends Julie and Alan visiting us from Toronto this past weekend. They came in their RV Roxy, and it's just so great to see friends and connect. And we had the best time. Have an awesome week. I'll talk to you soon. Wishing you ultimate health.